Good morning and afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Navigating the complexity of AI strategies require more than just technical knowledge. It actually demands foresight, innovation, and a deep understanding of the ethical consideration. Today, we are fortunate to have with us three seasoned AI leaders who will share their insights and strategies for developing effective AI solutions that drive business value while ensuring ethical integrity. Our discussion will cover essential topics such as integrating AI into products, how to leverage for better product strategy, our AI strategies and development, avoiding common pitfalls that we are facing right now with its implementation. And also we also explore how to make practical AI investment, addressing customer friction, understanding the unique aspects of developing generative AI, powered features compared to traditional products, which is totally a new era for us. Before we begin, I need to add a disclaimer that each panelist here represents their own view and not only their own respective companies. Let me dive and introduce you to the panelist. I hope that every panelist can look after who you are to introduce yourself, what are the products that you're working on, and what product that daily work that you relate to this topic. Let me start with Cecilia. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Cecilia Liu, and I'm the head of product at Sprig. So at Sprig, we're building an AI-first product experience platform where we leverage AI to empower product managers to ask the right questions, uncover insights and opportunities, and find the best solutions to build world-class product experience. And in terms of how my work daily relate to this topic, if you all allow me to get philosophical for a second, um, you know, we look at the various technological revolution revolutions throughout human history, what they all have in common is that the introduction of technology allowed humans to operate at a higher level of abstraction. So we believe and I believe that AI is ushering in this next major technological revolution. And it is a privilege to be among the thought leaders on this panel and in the audience who will help shape the outcome of this revolution. Super. Thank you. Jeffrey, do you want to go? Hi, everyone. I'm Jeffrey. I'm one of the co-founders and chief architect uh, at Amplitude. Uh, Amplitude is a digital analytics platform. Uh, we help companies build better products through a variety of tools, from product and web analytics to feature flagging and experimentation to customer development platform to session replay, uh, all the kind of stuff you need to build an amazing product. Um, and I'm traditionally an infrastructure engineer by background, but uh, I've been spending the last couple of years uh, trying to understand this, this AI stuff and figuring out how to apply that. Uh, at Amplitude, and so leading our efforts there. We think that you know AI is less about a totally different paradigm for everything and more about doing a much better job of the problem that we're trying to solve to begin with, which is uh, you know, helping people build better products. And so we're really excited about all of the ways that AI is accelerating that. Um, and yeah, happy to share more about that as we get into this. Super exciting. Thank you. VJ? Yeah, um, my name is Vijay. I'm a senior director of product at Heap. Um, so Heap is also a digital analytics platform. Um, and we're also part of Content Square, which is uh, like more of an experience analytics platform uh, encompassing a lot of different uh, like uh, qualitative capabilities like session replay and not heat maps and all that. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's really great to be here. I think um, I'm, I'm responsible for uh, for AI and generative AI capabilities uh, within Heap and also Content Square as a whole. Um, as of as of recently, and so uh, that's uh, that's been super fun. So I, I spend a lot of time day to day thinking about this. I think that the the shift that we're going to see is going to be pretty huge. Um, and I think on a more practical level, the way I think about AI is that, um, especially when it comes to product roadmap and product capabilities, the ceiling of what you can do is increasing, and the amount of investment you need to make to get to customer value is decreasing a lot. Um, and so. That's the thing that I think is actually unique and different about generative AI. Um, like we've had machine learning technologies for years, um, but I think the thing that's really exciting over the last couple of years is that shift. Um, it's enabling much smaller teams with much more uh, narrow skill sets um, to be able to deliver much more value much more quickly. Uh, and that's that's super exciting for everyone. Super great. And I'm happy to moderate this session. And one of the reasons that I'm, I'm now reading QC Quick Commerce uh, Commercial and Delivery Hero and that also touch food. So it's the retail business, and we are really dependent on all of you on how to build these kind of products to improve our consumer experience. So I think everyone will get a lot of benefits from having you here, looking into how retail is working, 
how AI in general can work. So let me let me structure the, the discussion today to get the benefit of it into certain topics. So I will start with how we integrate AI into our products in general. Maybe I start with you, Cecilia. How should companies in general approach integrating AI into their product? Yes, um, I want to touch on two points here. The first is that product market fit still matters. Right? I want to call out the fact that there seems to be an obsession in our industry where the the idea of putting AI into everything is very predominant, you know, putting AI into everything for the sake of having AI in everything. But you really need to consider, does the AI capability still serve the needs of the users? AI, the technology itself, does not make a good product. The value we create through the application of AI is what makes good products. Um, and what actually drew me to Spring initially was that the AI application here is so meaningful and not just a buzzword. It is a perfect use case of synthesis AI or synth AI that has such great potential to create real value. And the second point I want to touch on here is that you really should try to stay ahead of the trends and expect future capabilities. So don't be afraid to set a bold vision. This, this is an exciting time of rapid innovation. What may seem unattainable today may quickly become reality. So setting a bold vision in, inspires your teams to think big and continuously push the envelope on, on what's possible. And again, for example, here at Sprig, we started with a single synth AI use case of survey response analysis. And now we have this ambitious vision to define a whole new category that is generative product experience or Gen PX, as we refer to it internally. Super well. Describing the situation that we all face as a product management in leadership and even in product management day-to-day -day activity that looking after the value. And taking from that, maybe the question can be for Jeffrey, what makes a good problem for AI to solve? Because the value is very important. And how to figure that out? Yeah, yeah. I really appreciate the point that you made, Cecilia, and that's very much how we think about it, where, yeah, it's all about customer problems and solving them. And AI is, is a tool, not a product strategy. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about, like, of all the problems out there, like, which ones actually make sense for AI to solve? Um, and, you know, funny anecdotes, like a lot of times people will be like, what if we solved X with AI? And then I'll just be like, what if we just solved X without AI? Uh, and often that's the better answer. But now, OK, what, what is actually good for AI to solve? I have a few different buckets. One is the synthesis one that you mentioned, um, Cecilia, where it's like AI is very good at that, taking a body of known information and like turning it into something consumable, digestible, with a little bit of intelligence to it, a little bit of reasoning in it. Um, very powerful at doing that. And so there's a lot of use cases um, for that, whether it's summarizing, you know, any sort of qualitative feedback um, or you know, very lightweight analysis of just data that would take a long time for a human to go through. Um, there's two other ones that we found uh, pretty successful. One is, uh, I'll, I'll call it fuzzy matching, um, which is, it's you know, AI has not gotten very good. Uh, if you give a list of a thousand things and you give it a fuzzy criteria to pick the best ones, it's actually pretty good at doing that. And so we help use that in Amplitude to help people match, you know, their potentially complex taxonomies to, you know, some sort of template or some sort of analysis that they're trying to do. Um, and it, it basically like you replace a whole potentially very complicated system that you need to build from an engineering perspective with you know a simple prompt. Um, and the last one I'll talk about, which is uh, the one that most of the you know m exciting and crazy demos out there uh, leverage, which is kind of open-ended creation. Um, that's you know a little bit less applicable in, in our industries probably, um, but you know you look at the stuff like Midjourney or even ChatGPT, and they're very much in this. Because you don't have a very, very clear expectation of what you want out of it, the fact that it does something intelligent is always very impressive. And so we're applying that actually in uh, our experimentation product, where a lot of times people just uh, want different ideas of what I, what you know, text or images I want to experiment with on my website. Um, and you know, if they don't have a super clear picture of what exactly it is that they want, um, generative AI is a very powerful way to get a bunch of different ideas and try them out. And then obviously you have the experimentation platform behind the scenes to actually validate whether they're good. And so those are the three different buckets that we found quite a bit of success in. Um, and you can say if it fits, if a problem fits in one of those buckets, uh, yeah, you can probably do a good job of it. Super. You know, Jeffrey, I mean, that 
We have been facing this in retail, e-commerce and quick commerce, exactly the three use cases where we look into how we improve our consumer experience, looking at all these use cases and how that will impact all the metric that you can see top of the funnel. So I feel like it's very connected to what we have in retail. Maybe to close the loop in how to integrate AI into products, maybe a question to VJ. How does product development in general for generative AI powered features can differ from traditional product development? Because this is a question that everyone can assume at the beginning, it is the same, and sometimes they assume, no, it's absolutely different. Yeah, um, I think, so going back to like the point earlier I made about how uh, the ceiling is higher for capabilities, um, I think for us, it actually started with our user research um, at the beginning. Um, so like, you know, in a lot of times, in a lot of cases, we'll focus on things like, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just like talk to customers and uh, do surveys, et cetera, to kind of learn about where are their friction points. Um, but I think the moment you mention AI, um, you see this like wide disparity between people who think that it's capable of everything um, and then people who are super skeptical and think it's capable, capable of nothing. Um, and instead, what I've found is just focus on what the humans are doing, um, because I think if you if you believe and and uh, and I would argue that you should believe that we are progressing towards closer and closer to um, like you know a more artificial general intelligence paradigm. Um, and first of all, by the way, I don't think you need true AGI to like substantially change the unit economics of most enterprise software companies today, right? Like um, where you're where you have like thousands of dollars of people's time being spent setting up um, your accounts and like getting to value and, and all of that, like you can make a huge dent in that long before we achieve AGI. Um, and so a lot of where we started was we talked to our, um, our successful users within our most successful accounts. Um, and so we call these people enablers. And so when we talked to these enablers, we, we asked like, okay, um, clearly you've onboarded lots of people into your account. They're all super successful. What did you like? What obstacles did you overcome? So then they describe some problems, um, and then we say, okay, how did you overcome them? And it's in that moment when they show us their like slide decks and their cheat sheets and everything, that's when we start to realize the gears start turning of like the kinds of things that um, AI can be really powerful for for uh, for our product. Um, and so uh, you know that's one piece. I think another piece is the fact that with AI, there's a huge range of what your product is going to be able to do. Um, and also a huge range of expectations that your customers may have when interacting with it. And so I think prototyping early and often uh, is crucial um, with this kind of development. Like you can go take like an, you know, an AI co-pilot feature and you can make a bunch of mock-ups of it, um, but you're not going to get useful signal from people looking at those mock-ups. You're going to get much better signal from people looking at a much uglier but functioning version of your product um, that maybe doesn't work in 90% of cases, but has the same UX paradigm that you're going for. Uh, and that's actually exactly what, what, the, what was the case for us, is we, we started with a prototype that could... Um, that could basically take a user's question and turn it into charts and, exp and explanations for them um, for maybe 10% of our charts. And it would fail at everything else. Um, and we put it in front of people four weeks after we started the team. Um, and that enabled us to actually get much more context much more quickly on little things like the importance of transparency and giving people a way to actually see, well, why did you choose the things that you chose? Um, and, and that enabled us to learn lots more and iterate on our design. Um, and then the last thing I'll kind of add is uh, to Cecilia's point earlier, it's super important to bet on the changes. And I would say a big one to not get fixated on is costs. Like uh, early on, um, we definitely spent some time thinking about tokens, right? Thinking about like, oh, are we, um, is there, are there ways to like shave off a few cents per question, um, you know, in what we're sending, uh, sending to the AI. And honestly, the most impactful work that we ever did on cost reduction was to just sit there and wait for a new model. Um, and like, you know, this we, we lucked out with this once with GPT-4 Turbo. We lucked out with it again with GPT-4.0. Um, and I would say the important thing to do there is have really good regression testing in place. Um, if you have really good regression testing in place, when something new drops, a new model drops, um, you're able to take advantage of it really quickly. So in our case, for example, GPT-4.0 came out um, we were running our regression tests within three hours of the announcement. Um, we were running a 50% experiment within 24 hours of the announcement, and we were live in production with GPT-4.0 one week after the announcement. So 
like having a good testing framework enables you to take advantage of those that exponential shift. And believe me, the tools and infrastructure are shifting exponentially, and it's a really fun ride. Absolutely fun. Thanks, VJ, for the detailed answer. I think it makes a lot of sense for us and to rethink how we think about product strategy or product development in general uh, when we think about AI powered features. So let me let me take you. If we look about how the consumer, how we behave, how we react to our product development to enable empower or to empower our consumers, let's take it on the other side of it. How we leverage AI for product strategy and development in general. So maybe Cecilia, I have a question that can come to everyone who work in product with AI. How should teams leverage AI in general in their work to drive better product strategy? Maybe you can have some examples that significantly enhance your product strategy using AI? Yeah, great question. And actually, my thinking on this topic, I would say aligns really well with what uh, BJ just mentioned in terms of like finding the entry point for AI by looking at, like by examining the human tasks, right? The jobs to be done by the human. And I, I think, you know, um, on a, on, a theor on a theoretical level, I alluded this, uh, I alluded to this in my intro, but I believe the key here is to think about how we can enable our teams to operate at that higher level of abstraction. And I think AI, like previous generations of technological advancements, allows people to be unshackled, if you will, from the low leverage tasks. So think about all of the things you and your teams are spending time on today and find those low leverage tasks where AI and find those AI applications that free you and your teams from those tasks so you can focus on higher leverage things. And, and this is actually a central thesis in a lot of um, our product investments and value propositions here at Spring. So we think about this a lot. Um, so we look at the job to be done for a product manager. And we ask the question, what are the lower leverage tasks that can and should be done by the AI? And let's build products to do just that, whether that's analyzing hundreds and hundreds of survey responses or identifying correlations between user attributes and, and behavior. Got it. And, and just to co connect the story as well with VJ, when you were talking about the pillars that we need to focus on on development, where you can run the friction, where you can have that friction of customer adapting AI capabilities, especially when you look into different kind of vertical segments who can work with AI and your customers can be really different in terms of mindset, in terms of being open using AI. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know about y'all, but I think uh, when we've been rolling out our AI features into, into a beta and then launching them, um, there's two types of teams we talk to. There's our end users, right? So in our case, that's, that's uh, usually like product design uh, teams and, uh, and marketers, and they're psyched, right? Like they love using it. They're big fans of it. They're very excited to try new things. And then the other team is the ones they CC, the compliance and legal team. Um, <laughs> these people are terrified of AI. Um, and I think, uh, I think a lot of times people will come in with uh, kind of these like preconceived notions of, uh, okay, like first question I think everyone probably gets is, um, are you training an AI model on my data, right? Um, do I need to fear for the privacy of my end users, right? Um, and so that's, that's kind of like a whole category of things. And, and that's been a big factor in, in us thinking about technologies and roadmaps. Um, so like, for example, you know, starting out, we actually found a way to uh, to uh, develop a co-pilot capability inside our product that uh, doesn't actually yet read um, end user like query results. Um, and what's really powerful about that is that we can help streamline a lot of the work navigating our user interface um, and improve like the ability of, of our product to onboard and teach users on its own. Um, but we know we can get around a lot of those privacy concerns. We actually have a very strong privacy stance as a result of that. Um, but obviously, that wow. creates limitations in what we can do, right? Like, um, you want to give the AI the ability to read and interpret and summarize a lot more information. Um, and so we've also been looking at technologies like AWS Bedrock, um, because I think what's really powerful about those kinds of technologies, and by the way, what Bedrock is, is it lets you, instead of sending your data to a third party like, uh, like OpenAI, um, you can run models inside your own cloud so that the data never leaves your cloud. Um, and that's actually like 
what we, we believe that's going to be a big relief to our customers and unlock the ability to uh, to open up way more use cases in a very privacy safe manner. Uh, and so, like, yeah, I think I think the key thing to watch out for is um, is just like like legal and compliance teams that are coming in with a lot of um, fears uh, that are probably not well founded. Um, but you have to take the time um, and be thoughtful about explaining that to those customers as they onboard. Um, and then also uh, thinking about technologies that can enable you to do more in a privacy safe manner. Understood. And it makes a lot of sense when you usually come with a new technology, new ways of thinking and so on. Maybe I, let me reflect. I'm sure that if all the audience are having this in mind to avoid the pitfalls of AI, how to integrate it in our ecosystem. Jeffrey, maybe I, I will need your expertise to explain what are the biggest learnings from developing AI products? Yeah, yeah, happy to share. Uh, first, I'll echo Vijay's point about uh, compliance people. And uh, <laughs> there was a long period in Amplitude where I didn't have to answer questionnaires. At the beginning, <laughs> I had to answer security ones. And then recently, I've had to answer AI yes. ones again. And so we're, we're back in questionnaire land. And so please take that into consideration. And yeah, be very explicit about what data is going where. And that will make people. Uh, much more uh, amenable to the features. Um, you can consider that a pitfall, but but I have a more interesting one uh, to talk about. Um, I think one of the this this is not unique to AI as a technology, but I, I think people kind of overlook it, which is just designing your UX appropriately for the capabilities of AI. Um, it's it's really easy to say, hey, just you know, just slap a chatbot on it, and you see that in a lot of products. Um, and sometimes it's fine, but a lot of times it's like, okay, well, they, they've slapped a chatbot on it and it's not actually integrated with the product or designed in a way where you, it does all the things that you expect it to do. Um, and I'll say we're, we're a little bit guilty of this ourselves, which is why, you know, this is a learning. So in our, in our first version of uh, what we call Ask Amplitude, which is, you know, your, your traditional natural language to chart capability, right? It's, it's kind of the first thing you think of when, you know, general AI meets the analytics space. Um, we kind of had this just this text box, you, you type in whatever you want, and then uh, amazing, a magic chart comes out and it solves all your problems and you know, you go home, right? It's like, well, it's, it's not that easy. Um, one, it's, you know, if you think about even a human trying to answer a question like that, probably the first thing they're gonna do is ask you a follow-up question <laughs> or, or maybe give you a chart and be like, hey, what do you think? Um, and, and if you start to think about that and the actual UX and that problem, you realize, oh, okay, it's, it's iterative. The, the idea of doing analysis is iterative in nature, and you need to be able to validate, you know, you need to have transparency, you know, as you mentioned, Vijay, and you need to be able to actually like, you know, progress forward incrementally to get to the answer that you want. And so then we spent a lot of time like thinking about that UX um, in a lot of different places and trying to just apply, you know, just basic UX patterns um, with, with AI in mind. I think because of the nature of generative AI and it's, you know, somewhat unpredictability slash um, inconsistency in what it produces. That's why you see like kind of suggestions as a UX pattern in a lot of places because it kind of inherently has this human validation uh, aspect in it. And I think that's just necessary today um, before, uh, before there's some more rigorous or robust capability for validation built into the models where, yeah, you don't really want to take over the flow for the user. You don't want to pretend that what you're producing is going to be perfect. And instead you want to design your UX around the fact that it's not. Um, but just because it's not perfect doesn't mean it can't be incredibly valuable and save users a lot of time and, and wow them and do amazing things. And so I think just taking that into consideration um, is super important. And then, like if you think back to chat GPT and why it blew up, it's because it, it fits that paradigm really well. Like chat is a good paradigm for kind of open-ended, not necessarily correct output, and you will be impressed by it. Super. Um, I'm always smiling because I have seen this experience where we tried to build a chatbot to use AI and we tune the consumer experience and we figured out this is not the right way. And we have to listen to what the consumer wants, the job to be done, and then we take it from there. Maybe also, Cecilia, you can add more the pitfall that any product leader or product manager need to avoid while integrating <laughs> AI. Yeah, I would be happy to. I think the, the first point I want to make actually dovetails very nicely um, into um, what Jeffrey just mentioned. Um, I think one of the pit main pitfalls is to not consider, depending on your UK use case, to have the human in the loop, at least at the early stages, to ensure the quality and accuracy of the output. And if we think about it, our current LLMs are generalists, they're not specialists. So it is important to have 
human in the loop as a starting point to ensure the quality and accuracy of the AI output for your specific use case in your specific context. And I think the, the benefits of that um, are twofold. One is, you know, when we launch new AI capabilities, we're often met with a lot of skepticism. So not ensuring quality from the get-go can lead to users seeing inaccuracies and quickly just dismiss your value proposition and decide to not trust your product. Um, and we all know first impressions are important and you only get one chance to make that first impression. And, and the second reason here, the second benefit here is that um, establishing this quality feedback loop, whether that's by starting with a human in, in the process or just like continuing to automate that um, going forward, um, is that it sets the foundation for self-learning AI, right? Like self-learning AI essentially is the AI learning to grade itself and to continue to move toward the definition of good and better. So it starts with us like setting clear definition of what good and better means and continue to train the AI to grade itself. So this like human in the loop quality feedback um, allows us to create that foundation for self-learning AI and that just opens up a whole new paradigm of innovation. Um, other points I want to touch on in terms of pitfall, one I already kind of touched, uh, touched on earlier and that is focusing on the technology instead of the value. AI itself is not the product. The value we create with AI is what makes great product. Um, and the last thing I want to touch on is, you know, not having the right staffing or not hire, hiring the right people. So I am a firm believer that we ship our org structure. So if AI is the key investment area for your product, your company, your staffing should reflect that. And, you know, as Sprig, our first ever hire was our head of AI. And, and this ensured that everything we built had AI in its core. And this person also helped us understand how we can future-proof our investments, both from a technological perspective and an organiz or organizational perspective. So hire the right people. That's great. And just to emphasize on this, Helian, just a follow-up on that. Do you see that when we put the, in the cycle a human in, as a feedback loop, or I mean, to maintain the feedback loop, is this a short-term versus long-term strategy when we build up an AI product? I, I believe so. And I, I think, you know, this, there is no one-size-fits-all um, answer. I think it's very much dependent on your specific application, on your specific use case. Um, and then, you know, really what is the value of the AI output? Um, so in Sprick's case, you know, we are summarizing like study results. So we are identifying insights and patterns and opportunities. And, and those things can be subjective in nature in the first place. And to Jeffers only an earlier point, right? Like it can be an iterative process. And so we also need to learn from our users' perspective what they consider to be good, what they consider to be better. And I think that is a muscle that needs to be built. But then, you know, in the process, you lay the foundation um, to then like un enable AI to be able to um, kind of like automate more and more of that process to hopefully in the future be autonomous um, and self-learning. Got it. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So um, maybe a question to close the, the topic uh, about the pitfalls. Uh, VJ, uh, how do you ensure that you are making practical AI investment and not creating a new demoware? Yeah. So I think the yeah the, the demoware trap is very real. I think yeah. uh, you know any of us who <laughs> like work with executives like you know have um, you know have uh, they see a lot of excitement right? Like there's a lot of excitement around creating. Um, you know, the next, uh, the next exciting, shiny thing in the space with AI. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of noise out there, but usage metrics do not lie. Um, and so I think for, for us, the key thing that we pay a lot of attention to is just retention. Um, and so if you're building something that is useful, people will come back and use it again. Uh, and so we spend a lot of time, we just have, you know, week over week retention is one of the things that we track. We also track a lot of leading metrics um, that, that I think, uh, you know, help us create a really good quality improvement loop. Because um, that's, that's another thing that I think is, is true here is you can't just say, uh, I would say, especially with something um, that involves like natural language um, and, and LLMs is like, there's going to be a long tail of things that you are terrible at at the beginning without a bunch of small, like, you know, boring, mundane, iterative tuning. 
Uh, and, and so it's, it's really important to be able to measure that and also to put the time and the cycles in to improve it. So for example, we actually have um, metrics for, uh, for example, an unhelpful response uh, rate. And so it's like Ooh. the percentage of responses that we, that we get that we're, we're like, we know that that response, maybe it's like not showing you a chart or showing you something that's empty, right? Or it's like something that like we're fairly certain is gonna like piss off a user, right? Um, and we look at those meticulously. So our engineering team, like we, we look and review um, replays of like of those uh, those sessions in every every daily standup, um, and also in our team meetings. And we go, um, we're very rigorous about looking at those. We actually just set up like a webhook that pings us every time someone gives us negative feedback, and we pounce on it. Um, and so we build a culture of obsessing over quality um, as as one of the, the the key levers to improving it. And actually, over time, we've really seen that rate of unhelpful responses plummet. Um, and the, the, you know, the quality has gone up, our attention has gone up as a result. Um, and so a lot of it is just small incremental work um, to get there. Makes sense. And as we all hear, and I need to make the chance to use all your expertise, there's an open question that can come to the audience. Do you see long-term impact on AI integration on the workforce? I can keep 30 seconds for each one of you to answer this question from your perspective. Let me start with Jeffrey. Sure. Um, I think for sure, yes. <laughs> um, hopefully, it's a world where everybody just becomes very, you know, very productive, much more productive than today, and can create a bunch more value as an individual. Um, have a lot more leverage to, you know, build a billion-dollar company as a single person. But uh, you know, I won't comment more on that uh, <laughs> if AI gets further along than we expect. Makes sense, Cecilia. Yes, um, and, and not to sound like a broken record, I, I am a believer that AI, like previous generations of, you know, technology breakthroughs is really good at, you know, allowing humans to be freed, to be unshackled from lower le leverage tasks so they can focus on more high, higher leverage things, operate at that higher level of, of abstraction. And I think, you know, I, what Vijay said earlier in, in this uh, conversation really resonated with, with me, which is like what that could look like is the ceiling for individual productivity, for value creation, for like any, any individual um, has been raised significantly. And also the um, kind of the speed to unlock such value and also be, you know, very, uh, very much accelerated with the introduction of AI. Thank you. BJ. Um, yeah, so I, I agree with all the points that everyone has said about um, increasing the leverage that people have. So I won't repeat those, but I will say I on maybe a more medium or shorter term time horizon, let's say like five to 10 years, um, I think our collective standards and capital efficiency are going to go up, <laughs> right? Like, I think that, uh, I think, you know, we've been talking for a long time about PLG, right? Like product led growth. Um, and I think there is finally a technology here that can really rapidly accelerate that, even if you have an enterprise sales model, right? Um, and I think that we, we're all probably going to need to hold ourselves accountable um, to actually realizing the value of that improved capital efficiency. Um, like it's not gonna be okay in five to 10 years, I think, um, to have to pay tens of thousands of dollars and wait months to onboard a customer to get them to value with your product. Like you're gonna have to move a lot faster than that. Um, and I think AI is gonna be a huge part of making that possible for the companies that do succeed in that world. Thank you, great session, really great session. Thank you all for your incredible sharing experience and valuable insights that you shared today. And if you would like really to hear more from Amplitude, Heap and Spring, now it's a great time to go and check out their booth in the Expo Hall. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, all. Thank you.